presentation uh, version of it. I immediately told my husband when I got home, we're, we're getting rid of all our plastic food containers. <laughs> and so, and I've done the same thing. I've got, you know, now for years, and I strongly encourage people to get rid of all of their, their plastic, or at least, you know, don't uh, store things in it that are going to um, save or are going to you know, possibly leach the stuff uh, into your food. So, and definitely not microwaving in plastic. And it was really kind of scary for me because um, before, um, when I was in my um, like 30s, I had a really intense job and I worked a lot of hours and so, and I was single. So I lived on lean cuisine, which I was microwaving in plastic like every day. So I think that I have certainly probably contaminated my system and so I'm working really hard now to, uh, to make sure that I don't add any more to that. So, uh, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, to build on what Dr. Welsh has talked about. So he's talked about um, the, how plastics can, can be a peril to humans, particularly the development of fetuses and, and young children. And so I'm going to take that and um, talk a little bit more about the perils of plastic on the environment itself and on uh, wildlife. But of course, anything that impacts the environment Will ultimately impact us as humans. So, it's so so often people think that environmentalists are you know just out to you know save a tree or save the planet. Well, really, we're very self-interested in, in, as a human race in the fact that anything in the environment impacts uh, humanity. So, really, we're we're talking about saving humans and human health. So, um, many of you may know uh, me as a person who normally speaks about about things related to climate change. Um, so uh, we're going to start with the beginning of the uh, production cycle for plastic, and that is where we have a direct correlation or interaction between uh, plastic and climate change, because making plastic contributes significantly to greenhouse gas emissions, and greenhouse gas emissions are what is causing our planet to warm and is therefore causing our climates around the world to change. So there is a direct relationship to all this plastic that we use every day and its contribution to climate change. Um, plastic is made from petroleum and natural gas. And so right there we have um, so that connection. But as you guys are well aware, there's a lot of environmental consequences to the drilling or the um, obtainment of fossil fuels like oil and natural gas. Um, lately, we've, in this country, we have a lot of fracking going on, and of course there's a lot of debates about its impact on the environment, but there's definitely, Oklahoma's been suffering earthquakes, and a lot of communities feel that it's uh, polluted their, uh, their drinking water. So definitely a lot of significant impacts um, from um, obtaining the petroleum and natural gas, which ultimately goes into making plastic. So the, so the amount of energy required to make plastics, um, how much is that? Well, it's a lot, but just to give you sort of an example, we can wrap our head around. 12 shopping bags uh, is what it takes to drive a car for a mile. So the equivalent kind of uh, uh, oil energy that's in 12 shopping bags would drive your car for a mile. So that, um, and most of the time, if you go to the grocery store and you get your bags, uh, you use plastic bags, you're gonna get at least 12, if not more. Um, at the grocery store every single time. Uh, we have an enormous amount of plastic in this country. Um, people still use way too many um, plastic water bottles uh, for drinking, uh, purchased in drinking water. Um, those require about 17 million barrels of oil to produce. And um, I already mentioned all the emissions that come from not only the drilling, but the transportation of, of the plastic to the, to the source. Um, where it's going to be, you know, bottled or, or used in some way. Um, and then just the estimates of how much carbon pollution from plastic manufacturing um, is, and there's a big range here, 100 million to 500 million tons per year. But there's also, just again, put that in terms that might make a little more sense to us, of many of us drive cars, is that's equivalent to the emissions from 19 million to 92 million uh, vehicles being on the road. So um, there's a significant impact from plastics. So you can see that if we want to solve our um, crisis related to climate change, which uh, recently the UN has uh, released a new scientific report that says we really have to start making progress on reducing our greenhouse gas emissions in the next 10 years, 
um, as, a, as a global community, which means each of us has to do that too, we really are going to have to cut back on how much plastic we use. Okay, so um, a lot of times people are like, but I recycle my plastic. And that's, you know, great that um, some people do recycle their plastic, but unfortunately only a really small percentage of the amount of plastic we use in the U.S. is recycled. Um, you can see here on the slide it's estimated at only 12 percent, and that was an estimate from the Environmental Protection Agency. 80% of those water bottles that people, uh, single-use water bottles, not the kind that uh, Dr. Welshens was referring to, but single-use water bottles, 80% of those go to the landfill and never get recycled, just filling up our landfill. And that's approximately 38 billion bottles in the United States. And I don't know if they talked about it earlier in the recycling workshop, but here in Colombia, our landfill is filling up. And so even if you don't care about any of this other stuff, it's going to cost us a lot of money when that landfill fills up. They're estimating it has about 10 years left before we have to, you know, pay to have another landfill created. They're going to do it right next to the current one, but you still have to do a lot of work to create a landfill. They have to put in liners and things to seal it. So in about 10 years, if we don't change our ways um, in terms of um, how much waste we're producing here in Columbia, the landfill's going to be full and that's going to cost us even more money as residents um, to pay for how we deal with our waste. Um, plastic bags is always a hot issue. The single-use plastic bags you get at stores, unfortunately only a half a percent to three percent of those ever get recycled. And, you know, the only way to recycle those is to take them back to a store um, that takes them. And then, you know, many of you may have heard at the beginning of the year, um, a lot of our plastics that are recycled from the United States, they got put on tanker ships and shipped to China and other Asian countries where they were processed. Well, those countries have decided they don't want our plastic anymore, unless it's like, you know, just the best, cleanest stuff. And so they stopped taking it. And uh, two of the companies that are, or countries that announced that were Vietnam and China. And so um, a lot of communities that their buyers were part of that supply chain um, ended up just now they're just taking any recycling they pick up and just go straight to the landfill because they don't have a buyer anymore for their plastic. Now my understanding is Columbia still does, um, but it is something that, that can change at any time. So how many bags do we use? Whoops, I, oh I keep hitting them, that's why it keeps going off. <laughs> how many bags do we use here in Columbia, Missouri? Well based upon the typical person, and I've seen estimates of anywhere from 500 bags per person per year to 1,500 bags per person per year. Uh, Columbia, right here in Columbia alone, we could end up using 57 million single-use plastic bags. And that's a lot of bags filling up our landfill. Um, and in the United States, totally, we use about 100 billion, that's billion with a B, every year. So what happens to plastic when it gets uh, into the landfill? Um, Plastics do not biodegrade in the same sense of like maybe if you, you know, throw an apple outside, it's going to eventually biodegrade and disappear. Uh, plastics don't do that. Uh, they break down into smaller and smaller pieces um, when they're exposed to sunlight. And the sunlight does help that. That's one of the problems with the plastics that are out in the environment, like the ocean or our lakes and streams. They are exposed to sunlight, so they keep breaking down into these little bitty pieces like you see here in the photo. Whereas plastic that's not exposed to sunlight does not do that. It doesn't break down as quickly. And so they really don't know exactly how long it's going to be around, but they are thinking thousands of years or, or longer, potentially. And so, um, you know, that, those would just be landfills full of plastic eventually. Okay, this is a little video I wanted to show you about uh, the Great uh, Pacific Garbage Patch. Uh, there are actually multiple garbage patches around the world where the ocean currents cause things to, to uh, collect and form up. But the biggest one, my understanding, is in the Pacific Ocean. And this is a little video that talks about it and, and talks about um, some of how it got built. And I, I thought it was pretty informative, so we'll watch this. It's just a couple minutes long. The Pacific Ocean looks inviting on a calm April morning. But there is more than just water out there, and it is causing big problems. 
Enough trash to cover Texas twice over. A garbage collection double the size of that entire state, three times bigger than France. I think people are becoming more aware, but we got to do something about it now. Floating somewhere between California and Hawaii, way out west, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, the Pacific Trash Vortex. Call it what you will, it is huge either way. It's almost like a soup. 1.8 trillion pieces of plastic, say researchers, or 250 for every human on the planet. 80,000 tons and growing way faster than expected. When people think of this garbage patch, they think it's kind of huge piles of, of plastic, and it's a mixture of things. That's one thing to really keep in mind. It's almost like a, a goop. This stuff breaks down. It's almost like a jelly. The big question here is where is all of that trash coming from? And the answer, of course, is us. It's humans. It's plastic. It is man-made. But a number of different sources, and two in particular, being highlighted here. Japan, one of them, debris that fell into the ocean following that major tsunami back in 2011 and is still there, floating. Researchers say that accounts for around 20%, but they claim fishermen bear the main responsibility, around half of that plastic from discarded nets, chucked overboard, then left to pollute. Even if you were a casual boater, you could go through this in many, most of the time and not know you were in this garbage patch. They know all about marine pollution here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. In fact, they try to teach visitors about it. Education is key to changing attitude and behavior. So they're keenly watching an experiment that may help get rid of some of this plastic. The idea is that you put stations into the water with their own nets that help bring all the trash together. They will drift with the currents. They will concentrate this material. So if it gets concentrated enough, then you could remove it and recycle it, get rid of it somehow. So you're effectively adding more plastic to get the original plastic out? Well, but only a small amount, maybe in the nets. And, so, and you're concentrating what's there. So it's a, it's a concentrated enough soup then that you can remove the ingredients. It's so far out of sight, right. out of mind. Yeah. Why should we care? Exactly. That's, that's a great point. I think that people have to realize that 70% of the world's uh, oxygen comes from the ocean. It's a source of a third of the world's protein. And so if the ocean isn't healthy, then our environment isn't going to be healthy. And few will argue that action is needed, both at sea and on land, before it's too late. It's been estimated that by 2050, there will be more plastic in the sea than fish by mass. Phil Lavelle, CGTN, Los Angeles. Okay, so that's what you might say, well, why do we care that it's out in the Pacific Ocean? So, um, but, but we do care because um, a lot of times, you know, you said what, the, what happens in the oceans affects the environment, what happens in the environment affects us, and without a healthy ocean, you know, we, we could have a, a really unhealthy planet. So. How does all that trash get there? We talked a little bit about some of the causes. Developing countries are among the worst offenders because they don't have sophisticated waste management systems like we do where somebody comes by once a week and you know picks up the trash from your apartment or your home um, and takes it away. They, they a lot of times have nothing like that. So they are part of the problem, but I don't want to say that gets us off the hook because the United States still ranks 20th on the polluter list for ocean plastic. And this, because a lot of stuff falls through the cracks, it, it you know blows away, gets littered, gets whatever, and it, it ends up ultimately in the ocean. Um, so just to give you kind of an estimate on how much plastic goes into the ocean every year, it's eight point in 2010 there was an estimate done of 8.8 .8 million tons of plastic per year. So let's talk about another um, kind of hidden source of um, plastic that might be getting into our water. Well, not might be, it is. Um, microbeads, this was something that um, companies started putting into exfoliating products and makeup and all kinds of things a, a while back. Um, and the problem is, is that these microbeads are so micro that our wastewater treatment plants aren't designed to catch them. So when these flush down, you know, our drains, they, they stay in the water supply and then, you know, most of our water ultimately ends up getting recycled some way through um, back into somebody's drinking water, maybe not our own drinking water, but people that live downstream from us, um, you know, it ends up in their, potentially in their drinking water. 
So Congress actually did something right in 2015. Uh, as I was researching this, I was really pleased to see that there had been a bipartisan bill actually uh, passed unanimously in the Senate to outlaw these uh, microbeads in exfoliants. This happened in 2015, and there was a phase-in period, so it's just now getting um, fully phased in. But it's kind of a loophole because it only included exfoliating products, so you know, like a facial scrub or a hand scrub or any kind of scrub you might have bought. So they can still put them in other things. And so, um, so you still have to check your labels. In fact, I uh, was in a hurry yesterday at the grocery store. I bought some, some new um, makeup mascara, and I didn't check the label. And I got home, and I sat down, and I looked at my presentation here to see the uh, things that, whoops, moment, the things that are here on the bottom of the list for the, uh, gotta stay in front of this microphone, for the things that, the last bullet, it has some of the things you can look for on the ingredients list. And I was like, oh, darn it, I bought something with this. So that's going back to the store, and I could be sure I'm gonna, tell them why, because, you know, like when you wash your makeup off, you're washing these microbeads down the drain. So, uh, you still need to check all of your ingredient labels, maybe not for um, all the exfoliants, but my understanding of the way the law worked as of July of this year, they, no new exfoliating products can be distri distributed, but those could still potentially be sitting on store shelves. And so they're switching to, you know, more natural kinds of exfoliants for facial scrubs, you know, and coffee grounds and sugar and things like that. Um, so, you know, there's, there's still those kind of products out there, but be sure you look at the ingredients list. And then if you have any of these kind of products in your cabinet, which I still do because I stopped using them a long time ago, but I wasn't quite sure what to do with them. Well, <laughs> what you need to do with them is, you know, to get them out of your home if you want is you can't like wash them down the drain. You can't even really recycle the jar because you need to wash the container to recycle the container, but that would expose microbeads to the water system. So you just have to pretty much bundle it up and put it in your trash and let it go to the landfill. As you can see here, the huge amount of um, beads that are in any particular um, thing. So like one use of a facial scrub can produce anywhere from about 4,500 beads to 9,400 beads. So that's, that's a lot of little beads. So a lot of, uh, and so some of the problem with these micro bits of plastic in the ocean or micro bits of plastic, you know, entering our lakes and rivers and streams is that animals ingest them. And they ingest the small plastic bits as well as the, the big plastic trash that we um, are throwing away or allowing to get into the um, water systems. And so this is just a, a visual a photo from the contents they took out of a dead sperm whale um, in 2013. This one was um, died off the coast of Spain, so they autopsied it and they removed um, all the things that were blocking its digestive tract and were preventing it from being able to eat real food. And this one whale had 59 pieces of plastic in it, totally 37 pounds. And what you see here, all those black things, are black um, plastic, large black plastic trash bags. So, um, so the, you know, wildlife just can't tell the difference between our trash and their food. Another example, uh, in 2016, researchers found um, 13 dead sperm whales off the coast of Germany, and they also were found to have significant plastic debris in their system. And so, you know, it's our plastic is killing, you know, the rest of the creatures of this world. And ingestion isn't the only problem. You heard in the video where um, the um, careless fishermen lose a lot of their nets and their other uh, fishing supplies um, out in the ocean environment. And this plastic gets wrapped around heads, fins, flippers, tails of all kinds of marine animals, and it restricts their movement, it restricts their ability to eat, and it can even make it difficult to grow. And so here's uh, two examples of seals that both have uh, fishing equipment wrapped around them. When I actually got a little depressed when I was putting this presentation together, because it, it was just like dead animal after dead animal or dying animal, and I thought, well, I couldn't help you understand the impacts by just showing you all those pictures, but thought I'd add a little other information along with it. Um, the other problem is plastic pollution contaminates the food chain. And so this gets back to the, the presentation that we were talking about earlier about all the toxic chemicals 
that can leach from plastic and what happens to those once they get out into our environment. So um, plastic pollution that's floating in water, so you get a water bottle or you get something else that's out floating in a stream or a river or the ocean, it actually um, acts as a platform to absorb any other chemicals around it. And we have in our environment from, from earlier pollution what we call um, persistent pollutants, persistent organic pollutants. And so some of these things are, are now outlawed, like PCBs, but they are still in our environment. And so when the plastic gets out there, this starts soaking them all up. And so um, this can be, or I said P, yeah, PCBs. Uh, it can be heavy metals, it, you can just see all kinds of things. If you think about it, like a piece of bread or a sponge, that's, that's really what it is. And then ultimately, of course, as I said, when it's exposed to sunlight, that plastic is going to break down into these micro bits. It's going to turn into the plastic soup they were talking about earlier. And that's when, you know, the animals confuse it with their food and they start eating it. So fish absorb the chemicals that they, after they eat the plastic, their fish body absorbs those chemicals. And so anything then that eats the fish that's higher on the food chain also can absorb those chemicals and can, is consuming those chemicals. So certain fish, of course, eat other smaller fish. And so this whole process, the chemicals from the plastic and the, plastic and the chemicals that that plastic absorbed while it was floating just bioaccumulate in the fish. So there are certain fish um, that are not good to eat. And I found one really good example, if you, if you want to look for it, Environmental uh, Defense Fund has put out a good list of which fish are contaminated with mercury and PCBs and, and other contaminants, and what not to eat ever, what you can eat like once a week, what you can eat like once a month, and um, what's a good dosage for women versus men versus children. So, um, so that's something if you're interested, if you eat a lot of fish, I'd recommend you, you take a look at that. So, and plastic pollution is harming the fish reproductive health. Again, this ties back into the research we heard about earlier about what these endocrine disruptors do. I mean, they disrupt uh, the endocrine system. And so we talked about bisphenol A, BPA, um, but I was studying fish, some of the things that they've observed um, for freshwater fish resulted that the fish were confused about which fish they should be mating with because they need to mate with their own species and with too much BPA exposure, they got confused about that. And so obviously this impacts their um, reproduction cycle and the ability to produce new fish. Um, the chemicals also were causing male fish to feminize, and so this again impacts their uh, ability to be uh, reproductive. And I think this is really important. In the United States, we don't depend as much on fish for our protein sources, but the most of the rest of the world does. It is their major source of food in many, many countries around the world, their major source of protein. So, and I don't want to just make it seem like all this is far away in the ocean. Plastic impacts land animals too. Here's an example of a cow that somehow got a little toy car stuck on its head because <laughs> somebody dumped that little toy car in the wrong place, I guess. And uh, some really cute black bear cubs with a, with a black uh, bear cub has a bottle stuck on its head. And there's certainly, you know, an infinite number of pictures like this available on the internet where people were careless with their plastic waste and, and animals. Of course, it smells like food, so they're going to check it out. And our local birds are at risk, too. Um, it is a, you know, this is a picture of a great blue herring, which we have some really great ones out at uh, Twin Lakes Park. And they, uh, you know, and I'm always picking up plastic trash out there just to make sure that it doesn't get, you know, for the birds and now the geese and ducks will be coming in for the winter. Balloon re releases are another source of plastic litter. Um, so um, it is bad for wildlife, both from the perspective of the balloon itself, as well as the um, strings that are often attached to it. So you can see here that these are two examples where the animals have been caught up in the strings, the plastic, usually some kind of plastic ribbon, uh, and the animals are caught up in that. So um, this can be uh, really bad too. So, you know, of course the balloon industry would like to tell you that their plastic balloons just break up and, and are minuscule pieces and they're, they're harmless, but, but they're not. Um, every balloon uh, behaves differently. And so if you are aware of 
balloon releases that people are contemplating or talking about, please, please ask them not to. Please suggest other things, whether it's lighting a candle or something else that they can do uh, to, to memorialize or celebrate the situation, um, something that won't harm the environment or wildlife. We have a lot of, of course, plastic in our local waterways. These are some, some local uh, pictures. And so I had, um, back when we were working on the plastic bag ordinance in Columbia, we talked to the stormwater team and said, well, what are the things you find most in our local creeks and streams? And they said the worst sources of plastic are plastic bottles of all kinds, whether it's water or soda or, or whatever. Um, other single-use plastics like cups and then plastic bags and then also on there are um, cigarette butts. So whatever is littering our streets, it doesn't just stop there. It goes into our streams, our streams flow into our rivers, and our rivers flow into the ocean. And so you might think something won't make it that far, it's never going to get all the way. Uh, but here's some examples. Uh, there's a great organization that's based here in Columbia called Missouri River Relief, and they organized trash cleanups on the Missouri River. And these are pictures of um, some of their work and some of the trash traps that they helped to clean up. And so these are just pictures of, of trash that's already made it out of a community like ours and has made it to the Missouri. And if it doesn't get cleaned up by somebody, <laughs> like Missouri River Relief, then it ends up going to the Mississippi and eventually it can work its way down to the Gulf. So, so the big question of the day is, is plastic really worth all that convenience? The risk to our health from the endocrine disruptors and the, and the toxic releases, the risk to the overall environment, the risk to uh, marine and wildlife. Um, you know, that's, that's the big question. And what can we do to, to really help on this problem locally? And although recycling is critical, and I know the workshop before me was re about recycling, and, and it's really difficult to eliminate plastic from your life. I know I've been trying. So what you can't get rid of, you do need to recycle, but recycling isn't enough. So what are some local actions that we can all participate in to make a difference? We, um, first off, is to reduce litter, because litter is really what's causing a lot of harm to the animal life because they're, they're getting um, mixed up with plastic they shouldn't be getting mixed up with. So it's really important to teach your children not to litter. It's uh, doubly important to teach your young men not to litter. Research has shown that uh, young men, like teenagers and into their 20s, are, are the worst litterers. So I don't know why, but um, that's, that's just what research shows. So make a special effort with uh, any of those uh, type persons in your family. And then help with litter cleanup efforts. And this doesn't have to be an organized effort. When I walk the dogs, I pick up plastic trash in my neighborhood so it never ends up going down the storm drain um, into, the, into the creek. So, and it's not that hard, and most of it's still clean enough that I can take it home and just put it in my recycling bin. So, um, and now, like I said, at the, at the dog park, I'm busy picking up all the plastic bottle caps so that the wild file that's coming in for the winter doesn't eat them. So you can do a lot of this yourself without ever being in an organized cleanup. But there are organized cleanups if you want to get involved with that. The city does some every year. There was one this morning on the Hinkson. Um, there's also organizations around Missouri called Stream Teams that you can get involved with. So you can just search on Stream Teams online and get involved with them, and, and they help that. Um, it's also important to make individual choices to eliminate new plastic from your life. And so I have a handout on that at the back of the room. I hope each one of you will take one of those and share it with um, other people in your family and, and friends, and I'll also be posting that online, so it'll be available to um, share out on social media. And then, uh, like I said earlier, you know, try and stop balloon releases. Make sure that people are recycling um, in, your, in your world. I have actually gotten several of my members of my family uh, to recycle across the country that were not recycling before. Like now when I go visit my in-laws in El Paso, they're recycling. When I first met them, they were not. <laughs> so these are these. It's important. You can influence individuals. So uh, support consumer action. So uh, there's been a lot of movement lately to you know ban straws and uh, get uh, companies to stop using so much plastic packaging. And so sometimes there's online petitions you can sign from organizations like Greenpeace and others 
And support posts, the most effective petitions I've ever seen online are the ones that are targeting commercial or commercial consumer companies like a Kroger, like a Pepsi, like a McDonald's. So those petitions seem to get really fast results, unlike the ones that we send to our uh, government. But um, started and they're doing it voluntarily and not letting, making us have to legislate it across the country. Um, some chains already don't have plastic bags like Aldi's. So, you know, there's already um, other chains and, you know, some of our local natural stores that are doing it, so I don't want to slight them because they didn't do it, because they were first, actually, so we need to, to honor that. So, there's, a, and there's too many individual choice things on that list to talk about, but I, I hope you'll read it. Um, and then I just learned something new recently, which is a way to eliminate wasting that blue bag that we have to put our recycling in. I was uh, talking with the um, city staff as part of the work we're doing on climate action and adaptation. And I found out that you can put your blue bag recyclables, glass, plastic, steel cans, whatever, in like a reusable bin or trash can or something, and you don't have to use the blue bag. So you can just set that reusable bin out on the curb, they'll pick it up, they'll give you your bin bag, and you never have to use the bag. There's two bad things about the bag. One, they're plastic. Two, they're not recycled. So they're filling up our landfill. <laughs> so, uh, so I would encourage you, if you're, if you're willing to, to do that, I, I tried it last week after I learned about this. And, uh, and it actually even saves work at the material handling facility. Because at the material handling facility, if you do put your recyclables in a blue bag, they have to rip it open and dump them out. And then, then they use the scooper to load them up on the conveyor belt. So if it's not in that blue bag in the first place, they don't have to go through that extra step. So that'll save us time and money too as a community. So think about using a reusable container for your blue bag recyclables and put it out on your curb. Um, or if you're, if you're somebody that lives in an apartment, you take it to a drop-off site, you could just you know, dump it in the bin. And then, of course, since recycling is with us, it's going to be with us for a long time, we need to make sure that we're buying products that are made from recycled materials. Whether that's, it's easiest to find products made from recycled paper materials, like toilet paper, Kleenexes, and um, paper towels, but there are things made with recycled plastic too, so, so be paying attention to those and look when you shop. Um, with that, um, I want to say thank you.